All right, there you go. Hi, um, this is uh, March 21st, 2015. My name is uh, Jason Bunn Parsons, and I'm assembled with a group of my friends to talk about the educational struggles of autistics. Um, uh, of the um, five individuals here right now, um, four of us are autistics who ha have completed at least high school, and um, and and a couple of our, our um, members have completed college. And I also have a longtime friend of mine, Yolk, uh, who has also completed college, and she'll be chiming in. And then joining us is um, Brian, who's the um, father of twin autistic children. And um, so anyway, so, um, so if, if anybody would like to step in front of the camera to give a, a, um, a just a brief personal introduction, or if you just want to say, say uh, bleh, you know, introduce yourself from your seats, um, you know, um, Beth, would you like to oh, okay. either in front of the camera or just from your seat, either way. All right, and I'll appear on okay. camera. You'll appear. Okay, somebody's okay. willing to appear with me on camera. All right. I've been friends with Jason for almost 20 years, and uh, I have completed college. And I, sure. I've been to some of his conferences, and I identify with some of the characteristics yeah. of autism, but I haven't been diagnosed, and I do not know whether I'm on the spectrum. Uh, so, so anyways, what, what did you take in college? Oh, well, I've been to college twice. Uh, at first, I, I majored in computer science right out of high school. And I graduated with that degree, and then I worked in that field for 24 years. Then mm -hmm. I got laid off, and I went back to school, and I have a nursing degree now. So, so basically, you have two high-grade college diplomas, or college degrees. So, I so, have two BSs. Two, two BSs. So, yes. Uh, I thought you had, you had a PhD in computers. No, no. No? Just bachelor's. Wow, okay. <laughs> Anyways, okay. John? Yeah. Oh. Okay, it's, um, so okay, the um, so okay, so basically John is here and he doesn't want to say any more than that at this time. I, go ahead. Hi, my name's Sam Hartlow, and I've known Jason for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually graduated high school in 1999, but I wasn't diagnosed until about 2003, I think. My first year actually at NAU, I did three years at community college. Then I went on to NAU and basically burned out. Um, but then once I found my purpose in life, I managed to go back to uh, GCU, Grand Canyon University, complete my degree, uh, wound up changing majors from English major to business major. Um, and I actually graduated with uh, 3.6 I believe about 3.6 uh, GPA cool. um, and made it managed to graduate actually with honors mm -hmm. um, so and I you know at some point I am gonna go back and get my master's degree MBA um, mm -hmm. not just this moment this okay. I got a few things I'm probably gonna be working on in the meantime okay cool so, um, Philip uh, okay. okay, my name is Philip, and I was diagnosed at a very young age with a form of autism when I was three years old. And as I got older, see, I'm from New York City, so they changed it over there to pervasive developmental delay with autistic features. And I graduated from high school with my diploma. And I've pretty much been doing a volunteer work or working at the Mark Community Resources Center. And um, right now I have a mild form of Asperger's Syndrome. And I've also known Jason for a few years. So what does uh, uh, Mark stand for? Um, our community resources. Yeah, yeah. Well, what does the acronym mark? Um, uh, Mesa. Um, um, it, it stands for something. Uh, I forget what it's an acronym for. Mesa Association. Yeah, I'm not sure what it's. Yeah. For. Okay. Anyways, but anyways, it's yeah, it's a place that helps people with disabilities. Um, then again, the M could stand for Maricopa. 
Anyways, but anyways, so yes, it's a place here in the valley. There's actually several locations, which is why I think it might actually be, be uh, the end might be for Maricopa because there's several you know, throughout the valley. But you go to the one in Mesa. Yes. And so, anyways, okay, thank you. Okay, Brian. I, I missed the introduction. What, what, are, what are we doing? We're just, uh, uh, just basically, well, whatever introduction you, you want to give for yourself. Um, you, you pretty much introduced me, so I, okay. I think that's good. Okay, so, um, so okay, yeah, so, so um, Brian yeah, is the uh, parent of twin autistic children, and what grade are they in now, first? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. Why was I thinking? Well, they're going to be going into first. So. Is there a way to turn up the lights in here? Um, yeah, the, the switch uh, is over there, the, the little slider, the white slider. So, this one right here? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little dimmer. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, it's just that uh, you, look, you look dark on camera. Oh, 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 okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what, let's just turn the camera over to, well, um, shoot, because, okay, the camera needs to be faced, well, it needs to have the back there, so, so, so if we can just rotate a little. Are you sure it's just that the screen, the view screen didn't dim? Uh, to say uh, no, because now, now that he mentions it, yeah, the camera needs to, um, needs uh, to. Let's see, this is better lit over this way. Okay, this is better lit, okay, so you can see me now? Yeah, I can see you better. Okay. <laughs> We're just a bunch of. Uh, oh shoot! You know. I just accidentally stopped the recording, but now it's going again. Okay. All so right. We're going again. Okay. So yes, indeed, we are not thousand-dollar an hour professionals. We're just a bunch of rank and file autistics, a parent of autistics, and a friend of autistics who herself might be autistic, but in any case, it doesn't matter. Um, so, anyways, I'm I'm going to start off. Uh, so by giving uh, a more detailed account of of my upbringing, um, you know, I was raised in the uh, uh, in the 70s and 80s, and um, and so what is now referred to as high functioning autism slash Aspergers is was not recognized until six years after I graduated away from high school, and therefore, you know, it didn't do me any good. Um, you know. I, I firmly believe that my parents, teachers, and all the professionals did the best that they could with the knowledge that they had at the time. The problem was they just did not have the knowledge that they had today. If they did, uh, I have every reason to believe that things would, would definitely be different. Um, uh, another um, at, um, a special factor involving me that it's, it's, um, that still might have hindered things is the fact that I was adopted and so um, so my adoptive um, mom did not have the information um, that, that my biological mom could have given about my first two and a half years of life, particularly that I did not say my first word until I was two and a half years old. Okay, so the two prevailing theories about why I was struggling, struggling academically, one was that I was having adjustment issues uh, you know, as far as you know, pertaining to the adoption, and the second one, that I was diagnosed with having seizures um, when I was four days, well, no, I had my first seizure when I was four days old, but it wasn't recognized as a seizure at that time. I, I simply stopped breathing, okay? And, um, you know, and, and that is actually a type of seizure. And it wasn't until I was 14 months old that I, um, well, was officially diagnosed with having seizures and I was put on medications and it was assumed that these medications is what was um, you know, stunting my, my, um, my, my, my development in basically all areas uh, of, of my life. And so, um, and it's, uh, you know, nevertheless, if they would have known that, it's, that I hadn't said my first word until I was 23 months old, it, it might have challenged these assumptions. and. Um, and and, and um, got got them to you know to you know reconsider you know that their assessment of me. But anyway, so um, so uh, I went through um, through through school um, in third grade. I was tested as having 140 IQ. By the time I graduated from high school, I had a 1.9 GPA, graduating by the skin of my teeth. So basically, you know. Um, 
All that they could make of me is I, I was some, some weird kid who was underachieving. Um, the reason why I was being bullied is because I wanted uh, the negative attention from my peers, so it was my fault that I was being bullied. And again, this was based on the best knowledge that they had at the time. Okay, and there's no point in villainizing anybody you know, over, you know, over this. And so, anyways, but, um, but um, well, in second grade, when we started learning times tables, we would um, you know, um, you know, have you know, a, a you know, timed test, you know, where you know, we'd, we'd give them a sheet and you know, we'd have to fill it out as quickly as possible. You know, handwriting the numbers was a multiple choice. And, um, and I wasn't able to, um, to finish my, my, um, my test. I, I would only get about halfway through, okay? And basically, you know, what I've been able to conclude from this, as well as from, from my inability to keep up with my class while taking notes in seventh grade uh, social studies and being the slowest typer in eighth grade typing, is that I had extremely poor manual dexterity. Okay, I was pathetically slow, and and you know, um, it, it, and and this was not recognized as a red flag for what is going, what what would happen to me when I entered the job, the job force. Okay, okay, so I'm the slowest typer, so I'm not going to be a secretary. Well, the thing is, a lot of jobs assume that you have a, you know, an average amount of of manual dexterity, the ability to, you know, to work quickly with your hands. Mine was so pathetically bad that I was not able to hold jobs at fast food places, in the construction industry, um, uh, an assembly line position that I had. You know, all, all these jobs that, 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 that were basically production-based jobs, I basically were, was not able you know, um, to be able to do and the red flag for this could have been, been recognized back in second grade had they recognized it as red flagged. And, and, and once I get up, got up into high school is, is, you know, is figuring out you know, what kind of strategy and set, because basically what I did was I just graduated from high school by the skin of my teeth and then I went to um, Phoenix Job Corps, which is a, a government funded vocational training program. You know, Job Corps is nationwide. A government funded training program. I spent a year and a half being trained as a carpenter and I washed out of that location in literally three months. Um, uh, I completed my training the middle of October uh, of, of 89 and, and I washed out the week leading up to Super Bowl Sunday of 1990. And, um, and as a Broncos fan, that was a very bad Super Bowl. We got killed 55 to 10. So, oh yes, that's um, yes, not a very fun week for me. But anyways, um, but uh, so anyways, you know, so that that's you no, know, um, you no. Know, one of the things you know that that's you know when discussing, you know, you know these um, these educational struggles is not only just talking about okay, what can we do to help, you no, know, autistic students, you know, you know, devise better strategies to be able to to succeed in the classroom environment, but also recognizing that some of these classroom struggles is going to be relevant to our, to, you know, to, you know, to our, our occupational endeavors, and we need to, to realize that the full range of jobs that, that being the slowest typist in class is going to cause you problems with. It's not just going to cause you problems with being a secretary, you know, or a receptionist, or administrative assistant, whatever you want to call them, you know, that, that, that the implications is much broader than that. Um, in any case, um, uh, I did go, go on to, um, to a, um, attempt to um, go, go to a, a, um, a private school to become a physical therapy um, technician, and, um, and, and, uh, I dropped out for non-academic reasons, which I don't want to go into right now because the, that's, the, that's, you know, because right now I want to stay focused on talking about, about the academic issues, how to succeed academically. You know, because you know, uh, you know, by the time that I, I went to, uh, to um, 
you know, to, to the Kerrigan, you know, I, I basically, you know, uh, I'd been diagnosed with autism for five years and I finally had an understanding and I had a, a, a game plan that I believed in and so I started in school and, and some, of, some of my game plan did not work out nearly as well as I had hoped while other things that I assumed would never work uh, was actually rather effective. Uh, particularly, you know, one of my strategies was to re record audially, um, you know, all the presentations, you know, and, and, um, and, and make that the basis for my study is replaying it over and over again, which is a nice theory. But the reality is, um, you know, uh, I really didn't spend as much time listening to it over and over again as I anticipated. And, um, and, and, um, and you know, but one of the things that, that really did help me is, you know, my friend John, you know, you know suggested making flashcards. Well, you know, that, that ties into reading, with, which, is, which is cumbersome for me. It's not that I'm illiterate, it's that, that I'm also a slow reader, slow writer. Everything having to do with literacy, I'm slow at, okay? And so, um, anyway, so, you know, but, but nevertheless, so he, you know, he gave me the suggestion, and also executive function as far as organizational, just keeping track of the flashcards, okay? Those who have seen my personal living conditions, and Beth is nodding her head, yes, she has seen my personal living conditions, and so has John, he's now giggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am not organized, okay, and that is very typical of a lot of autistic Aspies that, you know, and, you know, and, um, and yeah, I'm guilty as charged as that, and so the idea of having stacks and stacks of these flashcards to keep track of, it's like, I don't keep track of the stuff that I already have, but, <laughs> but, he, but he suggested that I go on um, Google Play to find a, a flashcard app, and so I like Okay, I'll try that, and I found one, and and um, and, and and I started using it, and and it actually worked. Because one of the things that I, I had to do is I had to verbalize. You know, I would be reading them out loud as I was typing them in, and verbalization is one of the things that does help me learn. It helps me focus on on what I'm doing, and as I was typing them in, I'm having to concentrate on what I'm typing, and I'm saying them out loud, and and it better help me. Uh, you know, exhort the information, and so, so you know, the the idea of flashcards, which I first you know scoffed at, you know, but you know, once I was starting to have some trouble, some of my ideas weren't working. It's like, okay, I'll give them a try, and and doing it, you know, you know, um, you know on, on my smart device, you know, um, to where I can also download it onto my my laptop, which that's actually why I used to type them in is on my laptop because I have a full keyboard and. You know, big hands like big keyboards, you know, and so, um, but, but then uh, I can then download them onto my, on my tablet, smartphone, any, any smart device, and so, um, and, and um, what it also you know, made it possible for me to do is, is a number of my classmates had, had, um, had, had spouses, children, and jobs, some of them had all three, okay, and so a lot of them didn't have time to do their own flashcards, okay, so the deal that, that I made with one of my classmates, okay, she would take the notes for me during class, I would convert them into flashcards for both of us to use, okay, and so, um, and it, and so, so basically, you know, you know, instead of me just simply leeching off my classmates, oh, please do my work for me, uh, I made uh, a, an arrangement where, where they help me and I help them back. And so, um, and, and if it wasn't for the non-academic issues, you know, um, which you know, I'm not going to go into at this point, um, you know, you know, I, I might have been able to be successful, you know, at uh, Kerrigan, no, nevertheless, so I, um, uh, I, I have devised a new strategy as far as going to Gateway, or not Gateway, that's, um, um, Glenn. that, yeah, Glendale Community College, yeah, Gateway is right over, around the corner here, um, but anyways, um, Glendale Community College, and, um, it, it, it basically, um, it, in doing what I was naturally born to do, which is teaching, okay, one of the things I'm wanting to do, and I'm going to be talking to Voc Rehab about this, I want to start a consulting 
no business to consult with people about autism, but before I can do that, I need to have some kind of a degree that, that, would, that would make me a credible source of information and, and I can you know, employ other autistics who go and get degrees you know, that, that are relevant you know, to you know, for autism and then we can go and we can consult with people about autism related issues, whether the schools, workplace, um, what, what it actually got me you know, started uh, with wanting to be a physical therapy tech is that I got tendonitis in my right shoulder and so I went for physical therapy and there was another autistic young man, he was in high school and he was undoubtedly lower functioning than myself and, and, the, and the staff there was a bit, you know, I think the word would be intimidated, you know, oh he has autism, we're not really trained in autism and so they were a little bit intimidated, you know, as far as, you know, being afraid that, oh, you know, what if we set him off by doing this? And so, one, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to become a physical therapy tech is to basically give people the information so they're not afraid to work with autistics, you know, because, you know, you really don't need that. There are a few autistics that do have extreme, you know, issues, and um, I do acknowledge that, but but you don't have to be afraid. Actually, you know that the four autistics in this room right now, um, you know, officially diagnosed autistics in this room right now, I have known for for five years. Actually, John for four years. But anyways, none of them engage in any kind have any kind of issues where you need be afraid. You know that they're all of a sudden going to have a meltdown. You know, it's not to say that we don't have our bad days, but at the same time. You don't need to be afraid of us, okay? And you know, you know our autism slash Asperger slash whatever label you want to, you know, use isn't that severe. Where we're just going to be set off for some unexplainable reason. Um, were you wanting to contribute something? Oh, okay. I thought you were, you know, raising your your hand. Anyway, so anyways, um, so anyways, um, and with that, I'm going to pass it to. Um, to one of the uh, other three, if you'd like to talk in more detail about you know, your challenges in school. Okay, Sam? Mm -hmm. Sam, you am? Yes, Sam I am. No, I do not like green eggs and ham. No, I do not like them with the fox. No, I do not like them in a box. I know that very well because I used to get that all the time in school. Okay. Uh, um, I actually went to school in the 80s. Uh, well, started school in the 80s. Um, my parents automatically knew something was different about me mm -hmm. right from the very beginning. And they, they tried very hard to get me into special ed, uh, but then the special ed uh, people would tell them, no, uh, your son is too functioning, his grades are too high to qualify for a program, but they knew my grades were never as high as they, as they could have been. Uh, in order to get anything from the school, my mom had to go down to the district offices and threaten to get a lawyer on them. <laughs> <laughs> and then at that, all they got me was special ed PE. So they pulled me out for about 15, 20 minutes and I could pull out like one fellow classmate. I'd be like, who wants to come with me? And everybody would raise their hands. <laughs> Okay, I could do one, and then I'd choose one person. Uh, you, you know, because we all know how much kids love their school. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right, that's sarcasm for those of you who don't know. <laughs> um, and I went on into, but as I grew, um, I guess the, the, the stress of everyday living was high. And I first found myself wanting to commit suicide at the age of 10. Uh, which I found myself, uh, vent that's I think is uh, what prompted me to uh, go to my, what would then be my counselor throughout the rest of the, the days I was in public school. Um, so we were noticing what appeared to be motor tics uh, and verbal tics and different signs of Tourette's at that time. Plus also, but I would never fully uh, qualify for a diagnosis. And then I was also showing other things that were considered signs of, or symptoms of, obsessive compulsive disorder, 
uh, and ADHD. And uh, over time, you know, and obviously depression. And uh, over time, it's like they talked me over, out of that and then uh, went off into uh, 12 years old. I'm switching schools and that did not go well. Um, I found myself really having to talk over that much heavier at the age of 12. Um, I would say that fortunately that, you know, I think that was the one time that I brought my homeroom school teacher to, to tears. Um, who was otherwise normally a very tough woman, as I remember. And then, you know, I would go on and, and throughout school, I never had close friends. And I think part of what contributed to this problem was that my family, um, we believed in this concept that everybody should pass themselves as normal. Uh, I mean, it's, it, my parents grew up in the 50s. That's, that's what they had. Uh, that's what they had to deal with. I've known people who as late as the 80s, I've had chances to talk to people who as late as the 80s, they, they weren't normal enough, they got institutionalized. And so that was, there was always the pressure that I should behave as a normal kid, even though I never was. Um, and so I could never understand why it was, I, I kept trying to, uh, like get on with the popular, get along with the popular kids, make friends with everybody. I can never really understand why I would be shunned. Um, at the age of 14, I remember having to deal with some very, very snobby, and I guess I never figured out that I should just go be with somebody else. I'd, I'd turn my back and my lunch would be on the, con on the concrete. Like somebody just sort of took it and threw it. And they, the way they, they, those guys treated me had me so depressed, I was trying to cut my, my neck like you would a piece of paper. Um, I mean, because I did not understand that, I, and then, well, I, then I get this, and then at home I'd be yelled at for simple things, stupid things half the time, and I did not understand uh, not to internalize this a lot of, a lot of, a lot of times. At the age of 16, I was, you know, I found myself dealing with a first-year teacher where my family kept trying to interject and ask for accommodations that I think both of us knew were not necessarily right. Uh, in many cases, for example, like the accommodations they get from the school would be where I tape record the lectures and then I'd have to go home and listen to hours of... <laughs> Because <laughs> those microphones, they were never very good. <laughs> and those teachers would wander around. And I remember one time in college trying to follow the teacher. <laughs> Until finally I got yelled at to cut it out. Um, so, uh, and I remember that time the stress got so bad that I took a steak knife and I would try to cut my wrist open. It was just like, I couldn't bear it. Um, fortunately, I tried the wrong side. <laughs> so, it uh, didn't really do any, any major, any, it really didn't do anything other than a small cut. But it was enough to get everybody kind of alarmed. I mean, I was called in my counselor's office. My, my regular counselor was calling me to check up on me. Um, and you know they had to they had to really counsel me and help me get through it and so I go on and I graduated fortunately you know I graduated from college but at this point I was convinced that if something major didn't change I wouldn't make it past the age of 25 mm -hmm. so I go to college my first three years was in community college I had lived a highly sheltered life, no friends, no nothing whatsoever, Methodist kid going to school now in Mormon town. Mm -hmm. Mormon town, Methodist kid. Um, dealing with, for the first time ever, dealing with people who are of a different, really different faith than me, being surrounded by that in many cases, um, 
not necessarily handling it the, uh, the, the way that I should have in many cases. And so I'm here in school being surrounded by people and I remember thinking that was, you know, being surrounded by these people and I remember that, that was the first time it really hit me that I started to feel like an alien on the wrong planet. Uh, throughout this, what really helped me cope that I did was uh, one of my, my regular counselor had me doing creative writing. Mm -hmm. Poetry, fiction, things <laughs> like that. And I actually would write stories where the aliens mm -hmm. were the good guys. They were just trying to live in, uh, on, on, on the earth. And sometimes the uh, humans were the bad guys. <laughs> but then they could actually ally with different humans who were sympathetic to their causes and there was like a sort of like a, you know and like I would write about like a push towards acceptance and things like that not really realizing that in some ways in a metaphorical way it was kind of predicting some of what I guess the autistic self-advocacy network would later start doing mm -hmm. um, but see I'm going to college and ha a part of it is I, what I thought I wanted to do, turns out I didn't really like, uh, couldn't really find my purpose in life, wound up graduating community college with like a general education degree, which basically is worth nothing unless you're going on to, to regular college. Um, took me about three years to really get, it actually took me three years to get settled, or two and a half years to get really settled in there. Um, I had to switch, I had to at least back out of one of the Bible studies I was attending regularly, go back to, you know, doing small groups at the Methodist Church. Um, you know, I would find myself feeling very pressured towards doing activities at the Mormon Church when I didn't feel comfortable being there. You know, in part because, like I said, I didn't know how to interact with them. And uh, then I went up to NAU, and NAU had a wonderful community. And despite all of this, uh, you know, I wound up going, I, I think I was encouraged by my uh, campus pastor at that time to go and uh, see the psychiatrist uh, at NAU. And it was at NAU where I first got diagnosed with Asperger's. Um, the way they did it, I didn't really care for because they, they tacked it on to all the other previous diagnoses rather than just say, here is something that encompasses what you're going through when it was in many ways. Um, so it felt like they were just sort of tacking it on and throwing on another label and I remember not being all that happy with that. Um, it was at NAU where I was, you know, at, at NAU, I, when I was at NAU, that's when I also started to get kind of burned out with the Methodist Church in the direction that it was going, and started to notice some issues with regards to acceptance there as well. And I kind of uh, but at NEU, uh, I found another one, which was affiliated, another campus group, which was affiliated with the Assemblies of God Church called Chi Alpha. Um, and I started doing both for a while, but I noticed Chi Alpha was way different. At Chi Alpha, nobody minded if you got up and started walking around. They had places where they would encourage people rather than discourage, they would encourage people to go up and write. They had different, th you know, it was, it was more, it was very spontaneous. Some of the groups, I came to understand, they play a song and then they just bang around on the keyboard and all the different instruments until somebody just so happened to be playing something that sounded reminiscent of another praise song and they shift into the other praise song. Uh, Basically, uh, what I would lay, you know, I didn't know why I liked this, I just knew that I did, and that I found I could make friends in this kind of a place. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was one of the girls who finally approached me and said that at first she was a little standoffish, 
uh, with me, not because uh, of me necessarily as a person, but because she had never encountered anybody like me before. And that's what spurred me towards kind of, uh, that's when I started to learn, that notice that I was uh, like geared towards like a lot of the advocacy stuff that I do now. Mm -hmm. um, also, it was while I was there that I had, oh, uh, you know, they had this, this guest coming in who was supposed to be speaking words over people's lives. And basically, what, one of the things that was spoken to me was that I would be a bridge builder mm -hmm. between different communities. So basically put, I was starting to get finally a sense of purpose in life. Um, burned out at NAU, again, because I didn't know where I needed to be, where I, you know, I, I found myself skipping classes, not really having a purpose to going. Um, then I wound up coming back home, and, you know, I had started trying to work, and I had different issues that would come up basically started me going and looking towards, okay, what is Asperger's, what is autism? I got involved with some online, couple of different online communities. Um, I'll try to keep this short, but basically put, I started to learn about the importance of support groups and the importance of community and how that helps improve a person's uh, behavior and troubles, if you will, struggles, if you will. I also started to learn what it means to accept yourself. And it was some years after I did this and started finding communities, uh, started finding groups in this area, where um, I was at a concert called the Rock and Worship Roadshow. And G Grand Canyon University happened to have a booth at this concert. And uh, they were, they announced Mark Millard actually got on stage and encouraged everybody to go check them out and apply, saying that they were waiving the application fees mm -hmm. for everybody. So it's like, I got nothing to lose. Go check it out, maybe see if they could take me. Mm -hmm. I don't even have to pay for the application. Why not? It's free. I went down there, applied. Three days later, I'm in. Mm -hmm. I'm getting calls from uh, Jen Wu's basically saying, we got your information. And uh, see, GCU was far more successful for me this time around. Mm -hmm. Number one was, I think for me, number one was I went in to GCU already having a good, better sense of purpose for what I wanted to do. But the other thing that helped me uh, get through GCU was, you know, even though it was an online campus, it was Jen. Mm -hmm. Jen never gave up on her students. She actually, uh, you know, regardless of what your issues were, or regardless of what was going on, she called, she would call me every week mm -hmm. to check up on me and see how things were going. And I think that that accountability also helped it also helped that she was able to find me a program within GCU, wherein I would have been a, wherein I would be able to accomplish what I wanted to actually do in life. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, I got a bachelor's of science, bachelor's of science degree in business management. I know it doesn't quite look at like, like right off, but uh, I graduated. Like I said earlier, I graduated with honors. Uh, Jen was trying to spur me on to even better honors. Yeah, uh, in many I was cases. there. Yeah, at you were, you were, at you were, graduation. you were, you yep. were at my graduation, yep. yes. And she was, she was there, actually, she walked graduation the same day. Mm -hmm. And she was there trying to encourage me to go after my masters. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving up on that if you're watching, I'm not giving up on that. I just put it on hold for now. <laughs> um, but I think, I think she was very instrumental in getting me through because, you know, because I had to deal with many of the same hardships. And this time when I'm also working through school, 
She helped me uh, plug into the online classroom. The online classroom also helped with because of uh, flexibility regarding time, mm -hmm. uh, doing uh, doing it all online. But it, it helped to have her to talk to um, every week. Yeah, yeah. It, for you, yeah, you couldn't have done no uh, classes at the at, at the campus because you live what about thirty miles. And I didn't have a car at the time. Yeah, it, so it, it would have been completely impractical for you to have attended classes or at, at the facility. So online really was your, your only option, and it worked great for you. It worked great, and also I think, I think one of the things I benefited from was I could see, when we were, when, as we were doing the lessons, I could practically see the applicability right away, mm -hmm. not just uh, in the in the current uh, community, autism community, but also in uh, my workplace as well, and that helped me. Uh, I think visualize it in any way. Visualizing it in that sense helped me keep going. Um, but like I said, I think I think a large chunk of why I managed to make it through graduation was because of her. I had a, being a very intelligent or be, being able to steer me towards where my natural, my, where my passions seem to be, as well as um, being very friendly and calling me, you know, calling me every week, checking up on me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it, it would have been, it, it, going to the campus at that time for the first couple of years would never have worked. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the takeaway from this is, you know, for me, uh, part of a huge chunk of uh, being able to get me through school involved, uh, be, involved two things. It involved, first of all, being in a place where I could be comfortable with myself as different. And uh, you know, being in a place, you know, and also, and being in a place where um, I didn't have to accept the responsibility fully of being what other people wanted me to be. Basically, learning how to love myself for who I am, mm -hmm. um, and did not feeling like I'm pressured to be something else. I also think part of what got me through it was the the community. In many ways. Uh, I mean, you, you helped give me a sense of purpose. I kid you not. Mm -hmm. Remember when we were talking about starting up the, the group or whatever, mm -hmm. even though that thing kind of filtered out, right. mm -hmm. that, that sense of purpose uh, and the sense of I can actually help people mm -hmm. that I got from, from that and also from working with AZ Assist where I've been for about seven years. That, that, that was a huge contributing factor as well. Uh, there's a sense in which you can work through your struggles better if you know the end outcome. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you. And um, one thing that, that I, I want to touch on that you brought up is the fact that, that you started contemplating suicide at the age of 10. I, I started at the age of 11. I never actually attempted. Um, the closest I ever came to attempting would have been back in um, '99, when um, well, when uh, when basically uh, I was homeless and my church, in order to help me out, you know, that they actually converted a storage room into a little studio because I was I was doing so much to help the church itself, you know, and so you know that they figured you know you know that's the least they could do for me, you know, and as I was. You know, you know, alone yet in that room, I was, you know, you know, uh, you know, I, and I, at the time I was volunteering to teach English to refugees, and the and here these refugees are coming from these these countries, war torn countries with nothing, were in better sh condition than I was, you know, and um, and so I actually had this thought that well, okay, I can't take my my, my own life until after vacation Bible school because I had already committed to doing that and. Is that is at that point I I you know, really woke up to the reality of that you know that you know the insanity of that and um, and that that's that's a whole nother long time I'm not one to go you no know, go completely into that route but um, 
but you know, it's, but you know, but just bringing up this this topic with other autistics, um, you know, I I, I figure in, in you know this isn't an official survey, but I figure that about a quarter of all autistics of our generation um, were contemplating suicide before they became teenagers. That doesn't include those who became who got suicidal as teenagers or in high school, and. Um, and the youngest that, that, that I know of attempted at the age of 12. Okay, and how old were you when you attempted? Well, I first, I contemplated at yeah. the age of 10. Yeah. I, was, I probably was about 16 when I tried to slice my wrist. And that being okay. said, yeah. um, I don't mean this, you know, I, I really don't mean it to sound critical of my family or whatever. In many ways, my parents are kind of like my heroes because they were struggling the best right. they could against something they did not understand. Yeah, and, and that, that's very important. That's, that's one thing that he and I are in complete agreement on. And um, not, not every autistic from our generation is capable of understanding that their parents and teachers didn't have the information that, that, that they needed. And so yes, they made mistakes, you know, but they did the best that they could. You know, and you know, we wish that all the autistics of our generation could accept that. But unfortunately, a lot can't, and it is completely self-defeating, you know, to go into that mindset. So, anyway, so anything right. else? Okay. Be it. Okay. So, Philip or John, would you like to go next? I'll go, but I'm. Okay. No problem. Okay. So yeah. So you're going to speak off camera. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, in my case, um, actually, I grew up in a very small town out in the middle of the Midwest, the middle of Iowa, and um. Actually, as far as from day one, I had educational problems. I literally, I uh, failed kindergarten, and that kind of set up everything for us. Because right up, right away after that, I was kind of known as the kindergarten that type. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. So I, that's where I, I had dyslexia at the time. So and um, so that well, that they got right. They figured that out. So they got me to help for the dyslexia. That, that, now, that okay. They, now there's different forms of dyslexia. What form did your dyslexia take? Reversal problems, like like I, when you, when I was spelling, I would have the letters misspelled. And, okay. So, um, so I they they did figure that out, but what what actually had happened? In fact, even it was actually before kindergarten. Actually, in my case, it all started off when I was in preschool. They um, when we were getting done with preschool, they had to give, give all the kids this this test. It was kind of, I guess it was, I don't. Know, it was kind of an intelligence test, and it was basically it was, it was, the, the design of this test was basically to determine if you were ready to go to kindergarten or not. Well, anyway, it was um, with me they got a mixed bag of results because okay, on one hand they had the they had the question for the smart kids. Okay, this mind you, they were asking a five-year-old kid um, what makes the day day and what makes the night the night night. And I guess I'm not an educational spe specialist, but I guess a five-year-old is not supposed to know that. But I. When they asked me that question, they said, well, what makes the day day and what makes the night night? I said, well, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And they were, they were like shocked. So on one hand, they were like, okay, this kid, this kid is a special kid. He, he's, he's bright and bright. But then they asked me the other question, which was more of a social development question. What color are bananas? And I said, pink. And then they, so then right away they were, they were running, running they were, okay, in fact, they were, they were quite confused at this point, okay, we don't understand this here. He, 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 the, the question for the, 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 to determine if this guy is, a, has like a superior IQ, he passes with flying colors, but then this question doesn't, and then, well, anyway, they told my mother, my mother was really mad, she kind of asked me, she and even asked, she said, John, what color are bananas? So I go, yellow. Well, why did you tell them that? And I said, well, if they were so, if they were so damn dumb, I wasn't going to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> as a five-year-old. Yes. Yes, as a five-year-old. Okay. Well, well, anyway, at this point, the the educational people, this, and you have to remember, this is way back in the 70s, okay? So Asperger's syndrome, they didn't even know what it was. Right. Mm -hmm. and they, they, they were not wanting, they were wanting to send me to some specialized place in the middle of Iowa, I grew up in Iowa, and in a little town called Algona, Iowa, where they were going to have like a whole bunch of specialists view me, and basically they were going to do all kinds. There's a whole. I had to go to this special this place, and what this was an institution for children that had that had like problems, like if you were developmental disabilities, retard, or something like that. So basically, they were going to do a whole battery of tests on me to determine if I was qualified to go to kindergarten or not, mm -hmm. and so I had to go to this thing and. 
And uh, in fact, it was kind of a, it was a very frightening thing because basically I was told from the get go. Basically, my parents had told me from the get go, okay, you better do, you you better you better keep these people happy. You better do good today because guess what? If you if you don't do good, guess what? They're they're going to take you away from us and they're going to put you in that home and you're going to be in, in, in you're going to be in the school with the stupid kids and you're never going to see us again. Oh wow. Yo. And um, well anyway, so I it was it was a scary. It was a scary thing, and so I went. I went to this thing, and all kinds of, of, of doctors and psychiatrists, psychologists, and everything. They did all, they did all kinds of physical, like they did physical, physiological examinations on me, probes and everything else, trying to figure out if there's problems with me. This is, and um, the head psychi- a child psychiatrist talked to me, a psychologist talked to me, a learning specialist, and all this stuff. And basically, at the end of the day, the the message to my parents basically was. Um, well, we honestly don't know what's wrong with him. He has a problem. Um, he he seems to be asocial. We really don't know what's wrong with him. Um, it is my our opinion, though. I think that probably the best thing you could do is go to go ahead and send him to kindergarten. He'll probably fail. I'm going to be honest with you. He told my parents this. You, he's probably going to fail. I'm going to be fully honest with you. He'll probably fail his first year. He's not going to make it. But you know, it's probably good for him to be around other kids his age. Just go ahead and send him to kindergarten with the, the idea that he's most likely going to fail. And um, so that was kind of the start. So basically, I was like, even before I even started school, I was kind of basically expected to fail. Even. Yeah. So I went through first year of kindergarten. I failed just as they said, and then after that, I kind of got marked. I went through the, the lower grades and and learned all the you know and, and, and had had various various issues like with and um, had that's when I had the dyslexia problems that I mentioned earlier. Got a little bit older, and um, and at this point I was a complete reject of the class, being made fun of, left and right, all this stuff, and ridiculed, and I actually got, got a little bit older though, and I actually started to excel, believe it or not. I, gra- I graduated valedictorian in my high school class. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I mean, at this point I was I was doing pretty well because I finally after after I got over the the dyslexia problems and I got over some of these other issues, I actually started to excel. And I actually went to college on a on a full room, full 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 board scholarship. Uh, just say, okay, you said you got over the dys- dyslexia. Was it because you you learned how to deal with them, or did it dissipate when you say that you got over your dyslexia problems? They sent me to several different specialists in the school. Yeah. In fact, that was another issue of mine, just because I was. I yeah. I was seeing, seeing seeing so many different specialists yeah. from a young age. I was basically all the other kids knew me as the special kid that yeah. they always had to be taken out of class yeah. to, to go to a PhD level specialist each and yeah. every you know. And yeah, the, but as far as your dyslexia, you said that that's that's you know yeah, that's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the you. Well, basically, so I, I, I just wanted to clarify: uh, Did your dyslexia clear up because of better strategies as far as how to deal with it? Or did it dissipate on its own where you no longer have dyslexia, period? Well, I had specialists that would pull me okay. aside and they Okay, so, so, so it's basically strategy? Right. Okay. All right, go ahead. Continue. So I graduated high school, graduated number one in my class, and I went to college, and in college, I had some more issues. Um, in, my, in my life, everything, I'm a, one thing about me, I'm a very black and white person. I'm either, I'm either an is or an isn't. Mm-hmm. Black or white, and, and there's no middle ground with me. Mm-hmm. You're either an extreme liberal or an extreme conservative. You are either you get the idea. Oh yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a very very 100% either or black or white person. Mm-hmm. Everything from my religious to my politics, you get the idea. Oh yeah, I'm fully aware. <laughs> but uh, yeah, go ahead. And um, <laughs> yeah. So I. I went to college, and that, and that actually caused some problems in college because, well, in college I found out that sometimes that there was middle ground in certain things, and it drove me crazy. Like I, I got a degree in biology, but like when I was like in biology lab, for example, they were they were te- teaching us you know, like bacteria. Okay, the concept of a gram negative and a gram positive bacteria strain, and it would drive, and they would teach us the concept. They would say, okay. The, you know, a gram, a gram negative would accept the sign, a gram positive won't. But then all of a sudden, that drove me crazy because he would like the teacher would say, "Okay, now this particular bacteria though is kind of in the middle." See, it kind of is, and I was like, "Wait, well, damn it! It either is or it isn't. <laughs> you cannot be it either either is gram positive or it's not gram positive." 
You know, I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that, that started to, it started to really trouble me throughout the things, you know, like when I, I would, when I would, it would be a, a major point of frustration when I would run into something where there was middle ground, you know, and, you know, you know, it's like, and, um, I, and I was the type of person, like, in, I had very terrible manual dexterity, okay, so, like, I was the type of person in chemistry, a class that was very difficult for most people, you know, and, okay, you could sit down, put me in the chemistry class, and, and explain to me an entire reaction, like, organic chemistry, wider risk, tell me, and tell me this is how th- this works. And I, give me the test. I'll give me the test. And I'll I'll write down a, a, a six-paragraph explanation. I'll get an A in the test, and I'll tell you exactly why it works this way. Mm-hmm. This is exactly what's happening. And now put me in a lab and tell me to do this. Mm-hmm. No, because mm-hmm. I had such terrible manual dexterity, like on trying to run a burette or, or you know, like in the laboratory or like measure so many milligrams of something to do to mm-hmm. to do this. I I could never get it right. And, Mm-hmm. So I was the type of person you could I could explain it to you in theory, explain it to you in paper, tell you exactly why it does it then mm-hmm. and so I I ended up getting very frustrated on that. Um another thing when I was in college, I I graduated college, I got a four year college degree and never took a single note in a class. I, I, I can't take notes. I when I drink it and then so l- early on, you see unfortunately back in those days they didn't know about this uh, Right. Asperger's syndrome. So, in fact, I've talked to some students now, and some students they, they've been diagnosed with Asperger's. They've actually been able to go to they go to Arizona State University, and they've been able actually able to go to the disabilities department and tell them, "Hey, I have Asperger's. Okay, no problem. We'll hire you a note taker. No problem." Now, with me, see, back in those days, I wasn't even in the right. DSM, so they didn't even know it existed. So, I couldn't. There's no way I could get a special accommodation for a note taker right. back in those days. So, I had to learn very on like to when I was going to take a class, try to find professors that teach strictly out of the book, that don't add a lot of stuff to their class, number one. And number two, try to stick to subject matters, or, or it, like mathematics or, or something, like, you know, kind of like I was saying, where it is, one plus one is always going to be two. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no middle ground on this. Like, well, I think there's, I actually have a new theory that one plus one is going to, is, is, we should, should make that equal three, you know. It's, mm-hmm. Always stick with, and that's where I, I started, that was kind of the issue. I did. I did finally graduate in college, and I and I graduated fairly. I didn't graduate with honors or anything like that, but I did fairly well. I got a degree in biology and chemistry, and but then um, at that point, I kind of had discovered though that just that wasn't the field for me because well, because of the problems I described earlier. Right? right. Mm-hmm. Basically, I was more of a theoretical person. You know, like if you put like in chemistry, you, you tell me to perform the action or in the lab, forget it. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. You know. Yeah. And, so I couldn't do anything with it. Unfortunately, with biology and chemistry, you practically have to have a PhD or an MD or some one of the major Ds in order to do anything, you know. And and I didn't see there was no graduate school around that would touch me just because I mean I, there's no way I could do something. You know, I mean, I'll, you give me the test and I'll tell you exactly why it works that way, how it works that way. And I'll you know, give me an A in the test, but put me in the lab. I can't do it, mm-hmm. you know. And so, so I after that, it kind of. So I, in the job world, I ended up having to go into d- other um, job opportunities over the years. I've, I've struggled with r- various job inter- jobs. I've, I've had several different jobs, and finally, I had to basically figure out that I had to be in a in a job that where I don't work with my hands, and number, number two, I don't work with people because I am because I'm kind of a a social outcast. You know, I to, so that's why now I do work from home. Now I, got, I finally got a job where I work from home as a telecommuter. And that's that's helped me out a, a great deal because that way I don't I don't have to deal with anyone. And also the job I do is it is very very much a black and white job, you know, because basically it's I'm, I'm, I basically upset doctors all day because I'm an appeals representative. So therefore, when uh, they, they okay, we we think this uh, this hospital say was medically necessary or it wasn't medically necessary, you know, or you're denying my claim, or we believe that you, you're denying this because of a bundling issue, and we think that this was a medically necessary thing. Well, see, I don't even determine that. All I do is I, I read the appeal, and I and I figure out what needs to be done with it. Okay, this doctor here is upset because he, 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 this, he, he, he put this patient in ICU, and then we don't believe that he needs ICU, that we're only going to pay a, a, a regular room and board rate. So I, I, just, I'll have to, I basically send it to a doctor. The doctor re, re, reads the medical notes on the thing and decides and basically says, yeah, I agree, he, he needed ICU, or no, he didn't need ICU. And all I do is send him a, 
letter back in the mail. And nine out of ten times, send them a letter back in the mail that says, sorry, no, you're not going to get it. <laughs> and, it's, and, and the good thing about it is I don't have to deal with them because, um, well, first of all, I don't actually talk to the doctors. All, all I do is send them a letter. To, it basically, then they, and the bottom of the letter is a, a phone number that says, if you have any questions, please call, contact customer service at blah, 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 and then they, can, and then they get someone else besides me. And then <laughs> And so so never, somebody else has to deal with the problem that you cause, okay. <laughs> so, basically, so basically that's kind of, the, yeah. basically I upset doctors all day, but I do it behind in a place where the doctors can never ever talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so they basically, they read my notes all day, they read the letters all day that I'm saying, denying their appeals, and they probably throw them across the room and yell and scream and stuff, but there's nothing, in fact my, na my full name's not even on there, just John B. Okay. Uh, Sam? I was going to highlight something that I think you said. Now, you did you you indicated, did you indicate that you failed that you that the, you were told by these doctors or whatever that you would likely fail kindergarten and then you did or how? Yeah. Did they tell you? So, or did well, they, no, they tell your parents? They only told my parents. They, yeah, they, they told your parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. We did an ex that 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 actually aligns with an exercise we did at work, mm -hmm. where we found that where uh, you know it's like. They don't understand why it was why it was going on, but they, it was basically put. You get somebody in a room full of people that don't believe in them, and they're they're almost they're pretty much best destined to fail. Mm -hmm. And we see, I, I've had years of experience with AZ assist, yeah. and we see that with the young adults too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we have a lot of young adults that have managed to go to college, move out, start living on their own. Um, and this, the trick is, uh, in many ways, if you want to help a person succeed, before they can succeed, first you have to believe in that. Mm -hmm. You cannot come, and sometimes we have disagreements, uh, you know, even amongst our own, our own about this, but you cannot come at somebody, regardless of their situations in life, and say that there's any goal that they might have that they cannot do. You cannot even come at them with that mindset right. if you are going to be fully effective in helping them. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I actually had a similar prediction made about me. And during eighth grade, my vice principal told my mom that, that I would um, um, Drop, drop out of um, high school, um, be in and out of correctional ex institutions before I was 21, and be a total burden upon society. And um, and so, you know, so here I graduated from high school, so I proved that wrong. Um, I've never been in a correctional institution. I'm now up to 46, or I'll be turning 46, so I've proven that wrong. But the entire burden upon society, well, well when I was basically forced onto SSDEI, you know, it's like, uh, I just put up the white flag. I just proved my my vice principal was right all along, and and and, um, and that, that that and and that was another time where I was definitely you know suicidal back in April of 2009, you know um, you know but um, uh, but uh, but as far as me in kindergarten, okay, uh, I you know I had I was not talking full sentences. You know, you know, um, you know, in kindergarten, and so basically, what the um, teacher suggested is to withdraw me from kindergarten and put me into a regular daycare, you know, where you know, to give me that extra year to develop my social skills before putting me into a, um, uh, before putting me into to a regular kindergarten <laughs> class, and 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 it actually did work out, you know, for me. And you know, keep in mind, this was just a regular. No daycare. This was not any kind of a special school or anything like that. And for me, it, it worked. You know, uh, you know that's a little bit. You know that that's the, that's a little extra time. You know, um, you know, gave me the ability to talk full sentences. And so, so I did. You know, start kindergarten a year late, but I did start kindergarten. And um, and so um, and then, you know, went on from there. So. Um. How they finally found out about this Asperger, in, in my life I started having some very serious, very serious compulsive ad addictive behaviors. Mm -hmm. I, and I got to the point, I can control, I mean it wasn't, and the, it wasn't stuff like drugs or alcohol or anything right. like that. I was not a substance abuser. Right. And um, I got 
I got completely out of control. I went through a Chapter 7 bankruptcy because I, I got involved with a, in a relationship with someone and it, it turned awry and I ended up spending thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on an addiction that I could, couldn't afford and and, um, and it started and the pattern started going again. I nearly I came close to getting arrested, didn't get arrested, but I came close to getting arrested. And so finally, what had happened, I went to some 12 step groups is what happened and, and um, and I found out, see I come, another thing I forgot to say, I grew up in a fairly wealthy family. That's the other thing about, about me too. Um, my, my parents always said plenty of money, so like when I, w I went to private schools and, and, and whatnot, you know, and when I, when I was sharing that in a group, one, one day someone in, in one of these 12 strip groups says to me, well John says, well hey, you're from a wealthy family, you can afford this, why don't you, you should go see Dr. Ralph Earl. He's, he practices in Scottsdale. He, he's a Harvard educated therapist, he's 400 bucks an hour, this guy is incredibly expensive. He's the world's foremost authority on compulsive addictive behaviors. This guy has written several books on the topic, he is, he's considered to be the, prime, the world's foremost authority, you should see this guy. So I thought, what the heck, I'm going to give this a try. So I went and I saw Dr. Ralph Earl in Scottsdale, Arizona, and quite a sobering experience. Some of the people inside that office, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I literally, when I'm sitting inside inside this this doctor's office, I'm sitting inside his office. You look around. And I'm serious. They bring some of the people, some of the patients are bringing in handcuffs. They basically the the court has ordered the people the the, the the Maricopa County Sheriff System has ordered these people. They okay, you you will receive therapy. You will go here, and then they, they bring the guy in hand. And so there's a police officer accompanying this guy, and that's the type of people that come to this place. So it was to talk about a sobering experience. So I. Got to talking, got to talking to Dr. Ralph Earl, and and um, I saw him for a few times, and and he noticed some very peculiar things about me because he couldn't he couldn't figure out what was going. He noticed well, first of all, like when he would would, would talk to me in, in in the session that I would never look him in the eye, for example. He noticed that, and then he also noticed like there are certain there are certain things that I absolutely would not do. You know, and, and he found it quite weird. You know, it, it was like um, because they. I would like for like say pretend like uh, pretend you were a cocaine addict, okay? And um, pretend like if let's say that cocaine was legal in um, I don't know Canada. Well, pretend it's not. But I'm just using this as an example. Pretend that cocaine was legal in the country of Canada, but it wasn't legal here. Would you get on a plane, fly to to um, Canada, buy your cocaine, and then come back to the United States just in order to avoid the law, for example? And he also noticed there was certain, a lot of I just had some very strange moralistic very rigid behaviors. He had never seen the, he had never seen this in, a, in, a, in an addicted person before. He had never seen an addict quite. In fact, he didn't know exactly how to deal with this. He was like, I've never seen this before. I really don't know what's going on here. And so he talked to a few other experts in the thing and he finally, he finally figured out, it's okay, this is a, you're, you, basically he told me, John, you're a unique case. I've never seen this in my life, but I think, I think you have Asperger's syndrome. You know, and and I was like, wow. So then finally, it was, he finally explained to me, he says, no, he says, I'm going to be quite honest with you, John. He says, I'm not an expert on this topic. He says, I, that's not my field of expertise. My field of expertise is addictive behaviors. Yeah. So I, I, but he says, I'm going to, but I've talked to some other professionals and stuff, and, and, I, and I believe this is, this is your issue. Now, what I do know about Asperger's syndrome, he basically says, this would explain to you why you've been an outcast in your life, why, you know, you have social issues and all this stuff. And, yeah. And uh, another one of the things, because you've told me the story in much greater detail, is also yet, you know, your your um, ability to remember exact dates of when oh, yes. something happened. Because he would, like, for example, when he, when I was in, uh, sitting on his couch, you know, the therapist, said I was sitting on his couch, he would, I would talk, I would tell him about certain abuses that occurred to me. I would say, okay, on May twenty first, nineteen eighty eight, a really bad event occurred. It was an, I got abused, and he was like, okay, now this is. This is not right. It says no one comes into my office and says, "Okay, on June twenty second, nineteen seventy four, I was sexually molested or whatever." All right. And in fact, he got to ask me, John, tell me, are you really good at dates? And I go, "Yeah, okay, John, tell me." I, I, I'm interested in this. He goes, "When did you graduate high school?" And I says, "Oh, um, I, I says April tenth, nineteen ninety." John, you went to the church, right? I go, "Yeah." When, when did you get confirmed? I says. Uh, I says June first, nineteen eighty-eight. He says, John, when did you graduate college? May twenty, May twenty-ninth, nineteen ninety-four. Wow. He says, 
He's like, there's something not right here. And in fact, that's what. And then that's when he started. He could not figure. He had to talk to his, some some of the other experts in this because, as I said, his his focus was addictive behaviors. Right. And they finally they figured out that I that I had this problem. Yeah. Hmm. I was just going to point out it's like two thirty. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I'm I'm watching the clock. Yeah. So anyways, so um, so anything else? No, and well, that's but, kind of. Oh, okay. Why I'm here and okay. So um. So, Philip, would you like to talk about your um, experiences in school? Um, yeah, you did com well, finish up to high school, and you know, just what it was like for you. Okay, so, um, where should I start? Um, just, uh, you know, um, that it's, was there any specific things that you struggled at in school? A uh, oh, particular uh, subject, particular task, you know that you might uh, that you might have um, or been exceptionally good at. Either way. Well, actually, I've been to several schools. Actually, from uh, preschool all the way up to high school. Okay. And, and uh, basically, with me the. I guess the greatest thing that I struggled with was socializing. Okay. As a, even a, when I went to a preschool and actually went to a, the first two schools I went to was a daycare center and a, the a asphalt school, which was a preschool. Mm -hmm. And at both of those schools, I I myself didn't really like didn't really like to play with the other kids. I was more of a loner who would pick a certain place on the playground, mm -hmm. and there I would uh, be there by myself. And it really got to a point where the teachers had to push me to play with the other kids and their activities. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would work. Most of the time it didn't. But I wasn't really interested in playing with the other kids. Mm -hmm. And even at that time, I really didn't think much about it. Uh, and I'm sure the teachers probably told my family about it. And I'm not sure if my family was really uh, had any trouble with it. They probably were thinking as long as I, as long as I came out on my own, I wouldn't have any problems, so. Mm -hmm. But in school, the first two schools, it was, it was, a, I guess it was okay. Um, we, I guess the one thing that what really fascinated the teachers was whenever we had certain toys or blocks, I would always build them at exactly the same like the same structure. I would get the same blocks, the same structure, and I would always build it exactly the same every time I would play with the toys. And then the problem was I would always go to that exact same toy and the teachers would have to assign me to other toys just to get me to play with different stuff. Because I guess they didn't want me to play with the same thing, whether it was the puzzles or the certain blocks. So that was a struggle more for them than for me, because I was pretty happy playing with the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And when I got older, I went to another school called PS 153, and out of all the schools, I'd say that was the worst experience of my life. Okay, now where was this at? Uh, PS one is that is that New York? Yes, New York City. That's where New York City. Yeah, because uh, I know that 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 they named their schools like that. That's you know. So anyway, so yeah, because I know you used to live there. So hey, okay, go ahead. So this is up in New York City. Yeah, yeah and this was a PS one fifty three school. It was it was basically a series of school. You had the high school in the middle the junior high schools in the back, 
and the elementary school was in the front. Mm -hmm. Now within the elementary school I went to, there was several sections. You had the <coughs> sections where the normal kids went, the section where the special kids went, and basically it was how well you did at school. Mm -hmm. Well since the reason I went to the special class was because when I was at kindergarten, see my mom wanted to enroll me at a Catholic school where my brother went, but the teacher said no, I wouldn't be able to handle it, so that was the original plan for me to go to the Catholic school. Right. And they weren't willing to take me. But my kindergarten teacher said no, I wouldn't be able to handle it, so I went to the PS 153 school. So when they or say more like the Helen Keller school. Okay. Uh, so when they say that you wouldn't be able to handle it, is is it because they didn't believe you'd be able to learn the material at the rate, or was there some other problem that they that they foresaw? I think it had more to do with the socializing with the other kids. Okay. So when it comes to you know, learning math, reading, science, did you ever have problems learning any of those subjects? Well, at the time of, well, I say the first three schools I went to, I didn't really have a problem. Even when I went to the Helen Keller School, right. mm -hmm. I was doing pretty much better than the other kids at school, Right. Mm -hmm. in my class anyway. And uh, math and uh, reading and stuff, I was actually doing pretty good and I was doing better than the other kids yeah. at school. But yeah, because so one thing I know about you personally is that you're a bookworm. You know, yeah, you, you, you bring these great big novels you know, you know, with you to group and, and you know, you're one to talk about them. And I'm like, I would never be able to finish reading that, but, but, that's, but that's you, you love to read. So. That was the books, that was actually my weapon of choice because all throughout uh, high school, uh, uh, junior high school and middle school, since I wasn't really, whenever the other kids would go on the playground and, or in the yard and play, I would be in the little corner reading my books. Mm -hmm. Because I guess it was like a, a shield mechanism. I wasn't really comfortable playing with the other kids, so I would just sit in the corner and read my books. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the other kids didn't understand that. Some of them would actually come up to me and say, why are you sitting here reading a book? Mm -hmm. And this was the younger kids. This was like kids in first and second grade. Yeah. So, yeah, so I guess I was pretty different from everyone else. So what did your teachers think about your, des about your desire to just simply read books instead of play with other kids? What did they think about that? Well, in junior high and high school, they didn't really say much. It was before, it was before fourth grade because they were always on me to play with the other kids and I just didn't want to. Mm -hmm. And so and the, the teachers just went ahead and let you be, <laughs> basically? Well, the, in high school and junior high, yes, but not in the elementary school. Yeah. They had like uh, systems where they would ask you if you played with the other kids, and if you said yes, they would give you treats, and yeah. if you said no, they wouldn't give you anything. Now, exactly how old were you the first time you were diagnosed with a autism-related diagnosis? Uh, my first diagnosis was when I was three years old on my uh, third birthday. Oh, that, that early, so. so. Yeah, because I was born in 1980, and Actually, the first time somebody noticed it, mm -hmm. well, not really noticed it, but when somebody noticed something was wrong was the nurse practitioner, the mm -hmm. pediatrician right. at the, my doctor. Right. She noticed that something was wrong, so I went to another place where they ran some tests, and then finally I went to a, a Catholic psychiatrist. She was mm -hmm. a nurse slash psychiatrist, and She's the one who got the diagnosis of autism. Okay. And of course my family had no idea what that was, so. But luckily my older sister 
was going to college and mm -hmm. she was taking psychology classes and luckily she asked her professor if she, he knew anything about autism and she gave her quite a lot of information. So, so you were very fortunate that that, um, that you had people that understood you, you know, going, you know, so that's one of the reasons why they, you know, they weren't pushing is because that they understood, you know, that you, you know, had these special needs, so. I wouldn't say they understood me, but they, because at the time they really didn't know what autism was. Right. None of them knew what it was, so. Yeah, yeah. the diagnosis, they had a family talk, they got everyone together and it was just decided that I would be treated just like a normal kid. Yeah. Okay, so this was, um, what year again? Um, uh, 1980 you said? No, yeah. 19, around 1983, 84, around my third birthday. Okay, so 1983, so that would have been the DSM-3 um, original, the, the revised text didn't come out until 87. But anyway, so, um, so they were operating up, up the information on the DSM-3 in order to make these assessments. But anyway, so, okay. Um, so, um, all in all, you know, how would you say you know, that, you're, that it's, you know, school was for you? What, would you consider it a positive experience, a bad experience? For me, it was both, because the Helen Keller school I went to was, I have to put it, it was hell. Okay. As, like I said, I went to a special part of the special education and most of the kids there, it was basically a mixture of every single disability that you could think of. It was bipolar, schizophrenia, sclerosis, dyslexia, uh, bad behavior, disruptive kids, basically everything. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really a troublemaker, so... I was picked on quite a few times, emotionally, physically. I mean, it was a special class and they labeled me as the retarded kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they all had disability as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And I went there for three years and after the third year, when they said I, when my mom said that she was pulling me out of that school, I was really excited. Okay. I mean, she didn't see it, but I was glad to be out of that school. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, well, in junior high and high school, it was much better, but I had another <coughs> obstacle to overcome, and that was the academics side, because since I went to a, a Catholic school, the education system was much more advanced than the public school, so I really had to keep up with the other kids who were pretty much neuro smart neurotypical kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they basically knew everything that people with Asperger's didn't know, right. and then some. So. It sounds like they, they had a better foundation, like you didn't have yeah. You know. It was more of they had the, most of them had the brains for it. Mm -hmm. So it was up here. They had the mental capacity. And so what year um, did you start junior high? I started, uh, well it wasn't really junior high, but it was more like an elementary school. Yeah. So I started in like fourth grade. Yeah. Grade yeah. Okay. So what year would this have been? This would have been 1992. 92, okay, so that's two years before the DSM-4 came out. Um, so um, you know, by that time, uh, I'm sure that you know, Asperger's, you know, even though it wasn't officially recognized, that they were probably aware that it was on the brain because uh, Dr. Laura Wing was the one that actually introduced it to the English lexicon in 1980. And so, so, by, so by that time, it, it, it had 12 years to, you know, start circulating around the, the profession, and so, um, so, so yeah, that so they were starting to, you know, to put things together for you about about that time. So that's good. So, anyways.
Um, so Brian, you're you're the um, father of twin autistic uh, children, son and daughter, and they're both in kindergarten. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So yeah, um, you have a limited, you know, as far as you know, your children are just barely starting. But but you know, as you're listening to, you know, to the experiences, you know, um, you know that we've expressed as far as having. You know, compared to you know what what you're observing you know with your children you know how would you compare you know what what's happening now with your children you know compared to what's happened with the members of this group well I think obviously one of the the big differences is um, earlier and earlier age of diagnosis so as we've gone through some of the stories here you know Philip is one of the I think younger individuals yeah. in the room. I don't know, maybe contemporary with Sam, but um, right. Um, yes, about contemporary with me. Uh, diagnosed at a quite a young age, as opposed right. to later life diagnosis for the rest of you guys. Mm. Um, you know, our kids were diagnosed shy of their second birthday, so they were diagnosed, I think, at about age eighteen months or something like that. Right. Um, so we uh, we had quote unquote the advantage of, of an early diagnosis, which then led to its own issues because, um, you know, it's one thing to have a diagnosis, but then to get access to the services that mm -hmm. are currently being touted as what's, you know, the best for helping a kid uh, right. with a developmental disability. So, um, you know, we were um, fortunate, in retrospect, I didn't yeah, at the time, I didn't know we were as fortunate as we were, but later came to the realization that we were fortunate. We were able to get our kids into what's called an early intensive intervention program, mm -hmm. which there's a fair amount of evidence now in the in the uh, in the medical literature that the best chance for optimal outcomes from an educational standpoint for individuals on the spectrum is to get them into an early intensive behavioral intervention program to help them develop communication skills at an earlier age, which hopefully will allow them to, you know, succeed yeah. better academically. Um, and, and it's not just uh, communication skills, you know, the, the, the language and speech problems that are common amongst kids on the spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, also teaching them social skills, or at least holding um, that program at SARP, the Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center here in the, in the, in the Valley. And they've got what they, what they refer to as their community school program, which in essence is kind of like a daycare. They have, I think, three different age levels now. So it's sort of toddler class, um, uh, I forget what the second stage is, and then pre-K. And then uh, our kids went through all three years of that right. after they were diagnosed. Um, and I think it did help our kids uh, develop, uh, you know, good functional language um, skills. Um, you know, my daughter is, is, if anything, probably precocious in terms of her language now. Mm -hmm. um, my son struggles still with some aspects of language. Uh, he tends to script a lot, um, talk about things that are unrelated to what, you know, other people are talking about. He'll just mm -hmm. come in and start saying something from whatever he's thinking about or whatever last, you know, favorite movie he saw that he wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. But he can speak and he can respond appropriately if you get his attention and that sort of thing. Right. Um, so, but but that, that community school program at SARC, which is not truly a school, it's in, in essence, it's therapy. It's intensive right. therapy. The, the quote unquote teachers, which I think it's like for every 12, students that are in the community school, there are literally six quote unquote teachers that are in the room with them. And there are actually um, uh, what are called, um, well, they're, they're, they're therapists. Right. Um, and they're being supervised by someone who the BCBA, which has to do with ABA, if you want to, I don't know if we want to get into the whole discussion about ABA, yeah. but it's a type of therapy that's designed yeah. to help help kids with disabilities learn well, some of these skills. Yeah, well, I think it is important to note because, you know, and, and you know, well, and you're right. We don't want to, you know, get get into prolonged, you know, debates over, you know, controversial issues. But as far as, you know, you said that when when you started with Sark, um, you know, that, that they showed you a video up. You know, they compared the old um, um, ABA to what's now referred to as the new ABA. And as I listened to um, to a number of autistic self advocates who are also professionals, you know. And, and when they talk about what's wrong with the ABA, you know, they're talking about the old ABA. Yeah. And when they when they talk about you know what should be done, you know, it sounds like they're talking about the new ABA. And so, 
you know, and I don't know enough about, you know, because I'm not a professional, but it does sound like, you know, to me that, that there has been progress as far as, you know, whether or not anybody is willing to admit that there's been progress, and, and I'm talking about both sides of the fence here, you know, not just the advocates, but also the, um, you know, the professionals, but there has been progress in recognizing, you know, that, that there needed to be some adjustments in the program, and that some of these adjustments yeah. have been made, and so, um, so, so a lot of the grievances, you know, that, that's, that are now being, being, you know, um, expressed by the autistic self-advocacy, you know, you know, um, you know um, which I am you know, an autistic self-advocate, but nevertheless a lot of my fellow autistic self-advocates, you know, some of these issues may actually be a bit outdated. Yeah. Maybe not yeah. all of them, but at least some of them, and I really think that's important for, you know, to recognize that at least there has been some progress in this um, in this controversial situation because we need you know because there there is too much strife you know and and I and I definitely have made some strong stands myself which some people don't appreciate you know and um, you know and but in any case you know we do need to focus on where we have made progress right. and and that's one thing that I am not hearing either side uh, of the the um, self advocates versus others, you know, and we're not going to, there's lots of others, different categories of others, but anyways, you know, and, you know but there, it is important to recognize that there has been some progress, you know, particularly in the ABA, you know, just by what you're describing, you know, in comparing it to what the autistic self-advocates, you know, you know, are saying, it, you know, it does, you know, to me sound like there has been some progress and it needs to be recognized, so. Right. Well, it sounds like you've even had some progress just with your own kids. Right. The, the, the problem, of course, there is I don't know how our kids would have done had we not done that. So right. maybe they would have done about the same anyway, but I, I'd like to think that all this time and money that we right. invested in helping them <laughs> yeah. did end in, in up yeah. you know, helping well, I think it did, but I, you know, who knows, because we don't have any other comparisons. So, obviously. And, and my thoughts, this doesn't just go towards you, but it would go towards all, all parents. Your struggles will be hard, no, no. doubt. But never, ever give up on your kids. Mm -hmm. nope. Ever. Okay. Not planning to. Yeah. yeah. And see, so, what if, if this would have been the seventies, like in my case, before they even knew about all this stuff? I mean, yeah. Imagine yeah. what you'd be doing with them. Right. So, right. Right. so if you were to, you know, yeah, um, tell us what your, what both your children's greatest strength and greatest weakness, weakness um, is. Mm -hmm. you no, know, could you pick one for, for both? Uh, so for my daughter, she is. Um, very open to trying new things. Um, she she you know likes all the little girl stuff that you would expect little girls to be into, princesses and this and that. Mm -hmm. um, we actually just last night went to the father daughter prom at this kindergarten that they're <laughs> they that they that they're both attending. So you know she loves that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Her problem is that she um, she and I, I picked this up at a, at a local con conference actually held here at this, uh, at this campus. It was a, um, the um, AZA United had a, had a conference, um, but one of the speakers there talked about a tendency for kids on the spectrum to uh, experience catastrophism. So catastrophism is basically if something doesn't go exactly as expected, then the worst case scenario is of course gonna play out. So if she doesn't get to be the line leader in elementary school, which is a little you know, mm -hmm. uh, assignment that you can, yeah, every, right. every yeah. week you get a different assignment. She doesn't get to be the line, line leader. She'll never ever get to be the line leader again and she's just, you know. Just she's devastated, devastated beyond yeah. the point that she should. Even though it's really, and that's one of the things we're working on her with right. is the difference between little problems, medium sized problems and big problems. Right. And trying yeah. to explain those types of things to her. But yeah, she struggles with that. So, okay. um, your so son? My, my son, uh, strengths, uh, he's, um, he's very detail oriented. You know, I remember with one of the first videos we had them watch, which was trying to teach them some of their letters. Um, he said something about a car and I said, what is, what is he talking about a car? Cause it was a little, this, in the scene, it was a little toy of a dancing bear. And I'm like, well, that's not a big car. And then I realized there was a tiny little car in the background of the scene that he was 
picking up on uh -huh. it. Just like if you didn't like get up and scrutinize the screen, he, uh -huh. you know, you would you wouldn't see it. So he, he picks up on everything, but it, but it's also one of his challenges because like, we're, we're finding that he's very distractible right, right. now in kindergarten. He's got a full-time one-on-one aide to really keep him on task because otherwise he's looking up in the corner of the room or he's not really paying attention to what the assignment is and has so, to constantly be. So his up. greatest strength is also his greatest weakness. Perhaps I mean you yeah. know if he's if he can really hone in on things he's interested in and you know like you know back when a year or two ago when his well probably two years ago now when his when he was really into Thomas the Train he could name all the different Thomas characters and there's you know literally over a hundred of them I think now and he just knew them all and was like I could hardly keep up with all this stuff and I was watching the, the shows with him um, but you know he couldn't talk about more practical things you know it's right. what he was focused on and you know I think the distractibility the, the difficulty of focus whether it's ultimately going to be formally diagnosed as ADHD which commonly co-occurs with Autism spectrum disorders. We don't know yet. You know, that's, yeah. that's one of the things we're going to look into. But we're not sure how well he's going to do academically. Whereas we think, from what we're seeing with our daughter, she's probably going to do just fine right. in a regular school setting. With probably us, you know, keeping close eye on the whole social dance part of it, which is going right. to be, I think, what she'll probably struggle more with. Okay. But she's doing better there, um, you know, than we probably would have ever hoped even going into into this. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Anything else you'd like to? Uh, if we've got um, a minute, I guess. Uh, um, uh, what? Well, well they're, 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 they don't come here with a gun to force us out <laughs> right at three. So, so, so one of our current dilemmas is really what what what's going to play out going forward. So they're they're both in kindergarten now. Um, we went to this. We went to a private school. Um, it's a, actually a Lutheran school because we knew from other parent, families who had gone through SARC's early intervention program, whose kids had graduated out before ours, that this school was quote unquote autism friendly. They would be willing to take on kids with special needs. They would be willing to let aides into the classroom, which you know some schools don't allow that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we decided to go there. Um, my wife is having some misgivings about it. Um, for my daughters, primarily because of the religious indoctrination that kind of is part of going to a you know, Lutheran school. Um, you know, neither of my, neither me nor my wife are Lutheran, certainly, and so, you know, we're, we're hearing all kinds of stuff from our daughter who kind of picks up on this stuff and comes and talks to us about it, which is fine. I mean, she's in that environment, so she's going to pick up on those things. But we don't want that to be necessarily what she focuses on. We mm -hmm. want her to get a good education, not, not right. become you know, like a Lutheran, so to speak. Um, so, um, and our son, um, it's a different concern. So one of the kids that had gone, well, actually, it's twin brothers who had gone from SARC's program to the same school. Uh, at the beginning of first grade, this was this year, the, the quote-unquote lower-functioning um, twin of that pair was kicked out of the school because he was too disruptive. Um, he um, he uh, was not, he's not verbal. He uses a communication device mm -hmm. to communicate, but he also struggles with inattentiveness and would you know basically be disruptive in class and despite numerous attempts to redirect, and he had an aide. The, the principal approached them, I think, about a month into first grade and said, you know, this isn't gonna work out. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, um, we're concerned that unless some of the issues that my son struggles with don't improve, we might be in the same boat next year for all we know. We don't know that, but yeah. my wife is afraid of that possibility. And what is our backup plan if he can't continue to go to this school? Yeah, of course, the flip side of that is also unless the school is also improved in how they deal with autistic kids. Too. And it's tricky, with, it's tricky with a private school because they're not under any mandate to do so, unlike right. public schools. Public schools, they have to give your child an education. And a private school can basically, you know, this isn't going to work out. You can take your kid elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Well, the, well as far as you know, describing your son, he is verbal. And so, um, you know, and, um, yeah, and so, you know, so, um, you know, well, one of the things, you know, that, you know, that, that Sue and, and Tara, okay, the, the group that we all met at was, is a group led by Sue Galabak, who's a, now retired occupational therapist and Tara Marshall, who's a speech language pathology assistant. A lot of times, you know, the non-autistic, well, so they understand autism from both a personal professional point of view. Anyways, a lot of times non-verbal autistics will have, 
you know, additional behavioral issues because they cannot adequately express what's going on. Right. And so, and so, you know, so the professionals that they, they mean well, but 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 they're handling the situation completely contrary because you know that they really don't know what to do. Where your son, from what you're describing, has verbal communication skills. So you know, and, and you haven't mentioned anything about him having any kind of real outburst. So no, there, he has behavioral issues, and I, I think that's actually our concern. And, yeah. and I think it was the same issue for this this kid that was a, a grade ahead of uh, yeah. of our kids. Um, he. Um, would disrupt the class. You know, right. if he was frustrated about something, this kid would apparently yeah. throw things, um, like you know, grab something in the classroom and throw it at the teacher yeah. if she was trying to redirect him or whatever. Yeah. And they just can't have that happening throughout the class. Yeah. Um, well, it sounds like, but he had an aide with him, and the aide was not able to deal with it. I, I think she sounds was, like maybe they need a better aide too. Well, <laughs> right, and 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 we're we're experiencing some, I think, milder issues with our son now. But you know, he he can he can communicate verbally, but not at the level of his peers. Okay. So, yeah. it, you know, if if he is frustrated about something, he may resort to a script, which is right. not exactly the right thing to say in yeah. that situation. Or he may, if he's really frustrated, lash out physically, which is what we're really concerned about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has he done this? He has. Okay. He has. So, oh, so okay. You know, yeah. So. One example, and, he, and he's got some sensory issues. Both our kids do. So, if, you know, for example, in, in like, I don't know what you call it, homeroom, the first you know, 30 minutes right. of class each day or whatever. One of the kids in his class, who's a close friend of his, I mean, he, he gets along real well with this little girl, but she's got a younger sister who comes. And my son is, is very anxious around little toddlers and babies that cry because the noise bothers him. Right, okay. And this little kid came up behind him at some other table and was excited about something and shrieked about it. And he was not happy and yeah. from you know that kind of spoiled the next hour of, of class because he yeah. kept perseverating on oh what yeah. is that kid coming back where's that noise you know and, yeah. yeah so he he has a hard time resetting when something sets him off and mm -hmm. you know that yeah. just leads to problems and so so he's got some of the more classic problems that I think a lot of you know kids on the spectrum struggle with and you know whether it's going to be to the level that we are going to be able to navigate the current school environment that he's in going forward, we don't know yet. My wife has sort of been looking around at other schools and an interesting thing we've been finding is that a lot of the quote unquote um, schools designed for students with special learning styles, quote unquote learning disabilities of different stripes, it, you know, maybe we're being a, a bit too cynical about it, but when you go and interview and you, we give them information about our, 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 our son, you know, they, they come across as very warm and receptive at helping kids with disabilities and all that, but it turns out they really only want kids of average or higher intelligence who happen to have some sort right. of learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. They don't want disruptive kids in their classroom. Right. Yeah. So they're kind of the gifted kids that might be kind of quirky, you know, a very high functioning kid with Asperger's, yeah. or the kid with ADHD, if you get them in the right environment, they do really well. Right. But they don't want a kid who's you know below average or not able to focus or not right. able you know so so we're you know we've we've been turned down actually at a couple of quote unquote you know schools that cater to kids with special needs. Now, um, oh, I have a question. Uh, well, just because I work as a psych nurse and mm -hmm. sometimes uh, we have like one on ones where a patient will require a staff member to be with that patient, and I the reason I asked about the aid and not necessarily they are maybe paid enough to be really good at it, but some of them are fantastic at it mm -hmm. and some of them are not very good. So just from my observation of the one-on-ones, the quality of the technician yeah. with, the, with the patient makes all the difference. So that's why right. I thought of that. Well, the, 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 the aid that we have with our son right now is someone actually that we carried through. She used to be one of our habilitation specialists that he's known for years. And she's oh, okay, very so that's good. good. And when we brought her along into the school environment thinking that would ease the transition from, right. from one setting to another, and it right. did. Um, but you know the, the the challenges are getting more stringent yeah. now that it's yeah. you know higher level academic expectations, right. bigger class size. Um, so we'll see. We'll now, see how it goes. I understand um, that there is a you know talking about you know this you know the special schools. There, there's one that is supposed to be autism specific. Um, um, uh, I don't. I don't know the name of it. Uh, you know which There's one? There's actually the Academy. There's a couple of yeah. quote unquote autism schools around the valley. Right. Mm. Some are um, 
really geared towards kids with significant um, disability. I mean, the, the kids that have a lot of behavioral issues right. and are nonverbal. Uh, I think the, the one that, that's known for that is Chrysalis Academy or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, but I think, I, you know, even though my son has more challenges than my daughter, I don't think he needs that kind of environment. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but, right. but does he, he doesn't fit in, for example, to this other school that we just looked at, uh, this, that's called New Way, and that's the one that has, it has great, you know, great class size, they've got two teachers per classroom with, I think, a maximum of 10 kids. I mean, we thought he would probably do well in that environment because there would be less distractions, but they, they saw the fact that he currently needs a one-on-one -on -one aid and read some of his assessments as he was just transitioning from kindergarten to, I mean, from pre-K to kindergarten, and they, um, they said, well, I don't think he's a good fit for us, so. Mm, um, I was just wondering, have you looked at AZ Assist Academy? Um, I may be more high school, but I don't, I, I don't know. Do they do uh, grade school f 1 through 12, grades 1 through 12? I wouldn't know offhand. I do know that it's an initiative that Debbie Weininger kicked off, but they they they, they may just be a special needs high school, but it will yeah. be focused on autism. So it's another thing that we've sort of uh, debated, um, you know, my wife and I, um, uh, the, the issue of there are, you know, pure schools that are, all the kids there are basically kids on the spectrum. We spent, again, a lot of time and money <coughs> through the SART program with the hope that that integrated environment, and I, I didn't explain this before, um, there were, I think, up to six um, uh, kids on the spectrum in that early intervention program with age-matched peers that were neurotypical, right. with the hope that the, the kids on the spectrum would actually pick up on some of the typical social behaviors right. of typically developing kids and not just be modeling off of each other with maybe yeah. less mm -hmm. functional social behaviors. Yeah. So to, to have done all that and, and kept him in a mainstream um, kindergarten setting this year, which he actually does enjoy you know, doing a lot of the things with the other classmates, and you know, when he's on task, he can do the academics. Um, um, but um, but can he can he could, could he do that without an aid? Is I guess the, the unknown at this point. And um, you know, how would he handle some of the transition issues and so forth that he struggles with? But 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 then to would he be at a disadvantage because of that? Because he's not able to model yeah. typical um, behavior or see well, typical. Yeah. Um, after I was adopted, we adopted a, a younger sister who had Down syndrome, and um, and you know this is a town of twenty thousand, so you know we had some resources, but you know not a lot, and so all the special ed kids were all put to, in together, and and one one of the things that that's you know that we observed is that, is that my um, little sister was mimicking the behaviors of of um, of of children with much more severe, you know, issues like drooling. You know, she started, you know, you know, you know down on all fours drooling, which she didn't do that before. And yeah. so, and 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 we realized, and the teachers, you know, observed it and it's like, okay, she is specifically mimicking this specific boy in her right. class. And so, so there was that discussion that, you know, as far as you know, whether or not that was the best environment for Kelly to be in. You know that maybe that she needs to, you know, and so I and well, I was a kid myself, so I was involved with all the you know exact solutions to that. But they, but that they they definitely made some modifications, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know for her, you know, for those reasons because she was doing that. So, you know, the the other factor um, that that plays into that um, in terms of choosing um, uh, a school. One of the issues is that when when we had our kids assessed through the Scottsdale School District, we live in the Scottsdale area, um, if your kids are diagnosed with a particular, um, well, label, um, you know, in this case, autism spectrum disorder, and you decide not to enroll your kids in the public school system, the... Um, resources, specifically financial resources, that would have been allocated to your child in the public school system are portable. You can take them with you right. if you choose to enroll your kid in a private school. So that's actually quite a bit of money that we're helping use to defray the cost of the private school mm -hmm. um, that, that basically are, are, are 
granted to us by the school district right. that, that our kids normally would have been attending had we gone through the public school system. If we then sort of enroll them in a charter school, which some of these autism specialty or, or other schools are that, that money goes bye bye. So you know we're so there there is a financial disincentive to change our mind and go back into the to the public school yeah. system that's, or a charter school system. That's wait. So you lose the money if you go into a charter school or go into a private well, school. You you don't have that money to use as you see fit for your college yeah. college education. You just have to take whatever services are offered by that charter school or public school again. So. Which in the public school our son would have been relegated to a self contained classroom. They told us that. Uh huh. Self-contained. Meaning classroom. he's off in a room. He's by off him. by himself. Oh, he's not mainstreamed, or he's just by himself. They, they would have put him in a room by himself, really? which is borderline offensive. Well, sometimes. that's that's what they said. I mean, they don't have the resources in the public mm. school system to do much else with him. Yeah. Wow. So. Wow. They, yeah. So that I mean, it was kind of a no-brainer. We weren't going to do that. We needed, yeah, but we wow. needed that assessment to then say we got this assessment. We can then take that money and carry it to right. you know. Getting our kid in a better educational environment. So, yeah. So, yeah, so parents have, have so so much to try to assess, just trying to figure out the right school mm -hmm. to, right. to, and, to and, put this. And part of the big reason I don't know details about uh, the AZ Assist Academy or, uh, is that my wife is really the one who's doing the lion's share of the scouting of the school because I work. You know, well, five days a week. And I, I know she, if I she, was, she's available to do yeah, it. Yeah. I, I, I can't. Yeah, I know if I was in your position, I would probably approach her and say, "Have you heard?" About well, I, I, I mean, she knows. She's looked at. I mean, her okay. day job yeah. these days seems to be going <laughs> right. around and looking, yeah. checking out schools. So. So. Wow. So, well, um, well, we wish you the best, you Thank know, you. and so. Um, and one of these days, I want to meet your kids in person, you know. Uh, I'd love to, too. Yeah. So we've heard so much about them over these years. and We'll, we'll host, host some sort of event at a fun place where kids enjoy okay. doing things. Yeah. 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 yeah, we'll do that. So, they, you would, know, they, would, they would be climbing the walls after about five minutes in this room. You know, yeah. you know I don't know how your kids would take well, but I always have, have, would take this, but I always have fun at the aquarium. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they enjoy aquariums. We've taken you been, aquariums. I don't know if you've been to the one down at AC Mills. That's in the, like in the mall. It's well, inside the mall. Been a while. Well, uh, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and close out this video yeah. now because we're just basically yeah. uh, socializing. So anyway, right. so so anyways, so I hope that that the people you know, watching this video online will will find this information useful, and I really hope that that it it shows the value of having autistics and parents sitting together and, and, and sharing you know, information with each other because you know, one of the things that, that I've been you know, speaking out about over these years is that the autism community is so segregated. Parents meet here, autistics meet here, teachers meet here, mm -hmm. and, and there is so much misunderstanding you know, in each, you know, with each group about the other groups and so much strife and the only way that's going to be overcome is to break down these walls of segregation and for us to come together as one community no matter what your level of functionality is and 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 just work together instead of you know that the that the high functioning autistic self advocates you know versus the parents of the low functioning autistics that is detrimental to all of us you know we need to not be fighting we need to realize you know how much value can be derived by, by us. You know by, by by us recognizing that we're all in this boat together. Okay. No, no matter what our level uh, uh, is, we're all in this boat together, and and we can all help each other. You know, and we are far better off helping each other than we are. You know, no, no fighting with each other. You know, and, and um, anyway. So so with that, um, we'll sign off.